uh, I always wanted to be an artist, always. From the time I left high school, I guess. I always wanted to be an artist, and I, it took me a long... Actually, I, what I learned in the Army, and I did learn some things in the Army, was kind of what, what it meant to be an artist. I had time then after, after, after school, after graduating, as a, you know, after being a student, then I had a t time to, to figure out, well, now what does an artist do or think, or where does an artist go, or what does an artist, you know, I even even to the point of where does an artist hang his pictures? In other words, I saw a lot of museums when I was in Europe, and uh, I began I began to get a, get the idea of where artist pictures ended up. I have to admit I was a very naive, unworldly student, and I really. When you were in Europe, which artists, contemporary and older? made an impact on you. Paul Clay, particularly. When I was in Switzerland, particularly Geneva, I saw a lot of Paul Clay, and I was most impressed by Paul Clay. Actually, uh, you know, in terms of contemporary art and artists, the one that, that I still remember vividly, you know, seeing almost like for the first time a real, a genuine article, you know, not a reproduction, was Paul Clay. It's interesting that you, you, you talk about Paul Clay because your work has been compared to Miro. Is that so? Yeah. It's been called, your work has been called biomorphic and because of that you've been compared to Miro. Huh. Which is pretty flattering, I'd yeah, say. I would think so too. You, I, I right. think. How do you feel about that comparison? Well, I, 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 I'm flattered, you know. I like, I like Miro's paintings. Moreau is a straight-out surrealist. And I always thought I had sort of surrealistic tendencies in a lot of my work. Talk a little more about... In other words, I you, invented, you said you made a very abrupt change. Yeah, from... from How Lance, did that come about? Well, I don't know. I sat down one day. Maybe I looked at some reproductions in books. I don't know. I'm not sure, but... I sat down one day and decided that I was go going to be a non-objective painter, a non-figurative painter, I, that I wasn't going to you know, use nature as my model anymore. And, and from then on, I, from then on I, I, I invented a kind of a, a vocabulary like you see there, a kind of a pictograph vocabulary. And I can, so there was no direct inspiration for the shapes. It was just something that. that no, I just in, from your I mind just invented world. them. Yeah, actually, I even remember when I invented them or how I invented them. It was kind of like I doodled for a while, until I came up with a bunch of shapes that I liked, and then I used them for a long time. I used those shapes in, in oil paintings, and in prints, and in you know, I used them for a long time. Leonard, you, you're a painter. You've worked in oils, watercolors, just about everything, a printmaker, um, a writer, a professor. Which of those things did you like best? Well, I guess, I guess over the years, I enjoyed printmaking probably the best of all. Um, I don't know why, maybe. Maybe I like the size of the work. It was small, relatively small. I'm not sure, but I like to do printmaking. I did a lot of printmaking. Mostly printmaking? Yeah, I would say mostly I'm a printmaker. Uh huh. I, I would say I would say that I've done a lot more prints than I have paintings. You've been a teacher for many years. Did you find teaching to be enjoyable? Yes. I found it very comfortable. I enjoy teaching. And you're someone that's been noted as a teacher in a wider vein, too, in that you've, you've written texts dealing with uh, advanced printmaking techniques. Yeah, I, I did that. Yeah, a few years ago, I wrote a textbook on like, kind of a how to do it book about printmaking. In your, your prints of the 50s and the early 60s, there seems to be a darkness to some of them. 
a kind of an edginess. Is that a reflection of uh, uh, the thoughts that you had about the period, or is that just something that uh, appeared in the work of its own accord? Well, I would suspect it, 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 that it just, just happened to appear. That there was no, there was no idea that 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 something dark was a resolution of, you know, where my mind or spirit was. You know, it just happened that way. What about selling prints? Was that a lucrative thing in the fifties and sixties? Could could a person make money selling prints? I couldn't. Maybe some people could. <laughs> I couldn't. My work was never popular. Actually, the money I made off prints in the 50s and 60s was f from winning awards and having the, the work purchased in a out of a show. We went through your archives at the Toby Moss Gallery and yeah. it seemed that almost every printmaking show in America had something of yours in it, a number of, of which comp of those competitions you ended up being purchased from. Yeah, I got purchased by a lot of competitions. And also a lot of prizes. My gosh, there's two pages of prizes. What do you mean you weren't popular? Mm -hmm. Well, I was all right in a juried show. I mean, put it that way. Let's put it this way. My work has never been very popular, my opinion, and it hasn't been very popular. But as far as competitive shows, I did all right in those days. But there was a, it was a different time, too. Very different than than uh, than it is today. If you look around, first of all, there were a lot more shows in printmaking. A lot more printmaking shows were very came by all the time. Secondly, uh, the, the competition wasn't as severe as it is today. Today, the competition in printmaking, I think, is extraordinary. There are a lot of good printmakers. In those days, it wasn't so common to have artists printmakers. It wasn't so common. Gail and I often talk about, you know, the, the, a lot of printmaking emphasizing the technical side rather than the artistic side. But today, there are a lot of artists printmakers. And it seems to me, in, in the forty, in the, in the fifties and sixties, there was more emphasis on. Just, Technique. Leonard, you, you, I'm quoting you yeah. from a while ago, and you said, the artist is a product of the society that nurtures him, and that society is dynamic and complex. He is responsive to the unrest of his society, and this sets him to search for new and unpredictable ways of expressing himself ways that will reflect the experimental nature of his epic and that will at the same time reveal the nature of the artist. And that sort of brings into the, the changes you've seen in the different decades, like the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, up to today. Now it's pretty nicely, pretty nicely written. I should write like that more often. I wish, wish I could do that again. <laughs> what about the difference between the 50s and the 60s and today? Artistically? Yeah. The art? Yeah. You know, it, it really, you know, when, when you think, think about it, it all, it all is, is how you see it, like whose eyes you're looking through to see it. And, and I realize that, uh, like today, when you talk to me, I'm much more knowledgeable about art history than I was, and recent art history, than I was uh, you know, all my lifetime, all the time I was teaching. You know, I don't mean Renaissance art or anything like that, or Egyptian art, which I don't know anything about. But I mean, when I say I meant, I mean art history from the 1900 on up and art movements. I really, you know, I knew all these movements were going on, I think. I think I knew from looking at the magazines, the art magazines. But I didn't have any kind of historical connection of like what, what caused them, what did they mean? And I, I think I do have that now. I've been busy reading in the last few months 
about uh, Cubism and Surrealism. And I have a kind of a grasp on where they started, where they grew, and who was involved, and, and, and you know, what kind of thing came out of that. And, uh, and, I, and I, I'm a great admirer of Cubism myself. And I think a lot of my works reflected Cubism. But but I'm only saying that because there, there, a lot of my work was more rigid, not as flowing. When it wasn't so flowing, then it was, uh, you know, more rectilinear, and which kind of was a response to Cubism. Not that I ever, not that I ever sat down and said. This is a Cubist drawing because I don't think I could have done that, or a surrealist drawing. But after the fact, you know, I wasn't really influenced by recent art history movements and, and, and that, that kind of isolation, if you want. I always felt I was, as an artist, I was isolated because I never was a part of any movement. What about Stanley Hayter and the Stanley Hayter workshops? Yeah, I, 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 like, I like Stanley Hayter, and I knew all about his workshop, but, but I, don't think he, he, I don't think he produced a product. He produced some very talented artists, but not a product. There's not a Stanley Hayter product. Uh, Stanley Hayter himself went through about six periods changing, and, uh, and some of them were better than others. Yeah, you know, for that my true taste. With most artists, I, th I think so. Yeah, pretty fast. And, and and me, you know, I always wanted. I always wanted to be consistent, but I never was. I always thought, wouldn't it be nice to have a kind of a con consistency about what what influenced your work or what kind of what kind of work you turned out? But actually, that I never could do that. Yeah. I went from one thing to another without even considering that I was making a change. Just, this is what I've got to do. I just followed my nose, kind of. So it was purely instinctual? For me, absolutely. I wasn't led there by any kind of knowledge or any kind of association with anybody. You know, one of the, the, one of the persons that I admired the most in my life was, was a sculptor. In clay, uh, Volkus. Volkus was a, I was a was a great influence on me, in a humanities way, not in an art way. And uh, I, I, I really, I really felt close to Volkus. Um, just as a human being. Where did you you print, uh, Leonard? Who printed for you? I did all my own printing for, 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 you know, for 20 years I was out there in the garage turning that wheel of that press. So I did, and I, you know, and, I, and I've printed, you know, thousands of prints. God, I got drawers full of prints that I haven't looked at for 15 years. How did you decide what size of an edition you would make? Well, I started with a big edition. Because I figured, well, if you had a big edition, you could sell more of them. But then I realized they just fill the drawer and they don't sell anyhow. So I decided now, now I get now I reduce myself to very small editions, anywhere from ten to twenty-five. Well, now you know they're very valuable now, don't you? No, they're being sold for quite a bit of money. I, I, I know I don't know that. <laughs> Nobody comes around here and gives me quite a bit of money for anything. So I haven't, I haven't run across that. It's a nice sounding phrase. No, it's true. <laughs> I got my prices up on some, some prints to a very respectable amount. In fact, a couple of buyers came by one time and I did a dumb thing. I scared them away because I, you know, they said, what do your prints go for? And I, and I started with a big price. I didn't tell them I'd sell them one for ten dollars if they came over. <laughs> but I, I, you know, I, I said seven fifty. Come on over and bring money. Seven fifty. And they said, "You mean a great big one?" I said, "No, they're not very big. 
<laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't a good salesperson. I regret that too. That was dumb because there was no need to, to you know, be pretentious about it. I guess that's why artists have dealers. Yeah, because artists uh, don't have their wits about them sometimes. Well, there are not many artists, are there, that are that are um, hustlers. Their own agents, yeah, yeah very exactly. few. Yeah. There are a few, but but they're rare, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. They usually get caught up with some some outfit that pushes them and helps them. Yeah. Did you stop painting, or you just lessen the amount? Yeah, I just uh, actually I did a lot of watercolors. I have a lot of watercolors. Let's see. My son just brought back a a show I had at, at Sandy Decker's studio, and uh, and uh, there are some watercolors there that are recent, you know, 2000, 1999. But mostly, you know, the last few years I've been doing printmaking. Every once in a while, I get the urge to do a painting, but and I would like to do oils, but I'm just not set up for it, and it's. It's too inconvenient for me. Leonard, I would think that printmaking would be much more difficult than, than painting, than watercolors or, or even oils, because of the, you know, the, yeah, the physical equipment. the physical involvement. Yeah. It's true. Painting is, is kind of, you know, is a pretty lightweight in terms of energy. And, uh, and you can get really tired printing, really tired.